Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this afternoon. Um, my name is Vanessa McElrath, and I'm a wealth management partner and advisor at MLNR Wealth Management. What I wanted to do today was just share some smart financial planning tips to keep in mind as we navigate these uncertain times as a result of COVID-19. Certainly, uh, the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic has a lot of people thinking about, and let's be real, uh, perhaps even losing sleep over finances now more than ever. With bills, investments, and mortgage payments to consider, as well as the looming fears about a recession, you may need uh, some expert opinion or some guidance to help cut through the noise and calm your anxieties. Um, and there's actually a number of numerous, um, there's a, a number of positive actions you can actually take to shore up your finances and kick off financial contingency plans even during this time. So at MLNR Wealth Management, what we've done is we've compiled a list of items we think um, you know, folks should know and what, what they can actually do now uh, to add value um, and take smart actions within their plan. Now, we'll dive into these details throughout the presentation, but again, what we've done is summarize some key steps that folks can take. Uh, we've also highlighted um, these items in a blog post in more detail um, with instructions on and background details on these positive actions at our website at mlrwm.com. So certainly um, feel free to check out that article there to help dissect some of these key topics that we'll talk about today. Now, one of the most important things um, that we always advise folks to do, um, regardless of the current environment, is to build up an emergency fund. And it's certainly times like these that I think highlight the importance of why everyone should have an emergency fund or an emergency cash reserve to begin with. What it really serves to do is just, it's money set aside to help you weather the storm um, due to unforeseen circumstances, whether it's an unexpected car or home repair, an unexpected job loss, or in this situation, even a global health pandemic. Um, you at least have a little bit of dry powder that you can tap into when things arise that you weren't foreseeing in your budget or as part of normal um, course of expenses. I often get asked, you know, what, what is an adequate uh, um, emergency fund or reserve? As a rule of thumb, I think it's ideal to maintain an amount equal to somewhere between three to six months um, worth of your critical living expenses. So this doesn't include discretionary spending like money that you may have used for entertainment, going out to restaurants and dinner, uh, you know, personal grooming and things like that. It's really meant to be your core expenses that you really can't do without. So mortgage payments, rent payments, medical care, um, insurance, things like that. So if you haven't started an emergency fund, you may wonder where to begin. Now, granted, I'll fully acknowledge it's not necessarily easy to build up an emergency, an emergency reserve under normal circumstances and, you know, even harder to do in the middle of an emergency. Um, that said, there are still ways that I think folks can get started. So one is take advantage of any anticipated lump sums. So perhaps you're waiting on a bonus or commission from income tied to last year, or you're anticipating something like an income tax refund. Use those kind of bigger pops or lump sum payments and set aside as much of it as you can until you've built up a sufficient emergency um, or cash reserve. Now, I don't like to suggest this as, as but if you are in a very dire circumstance and you really have no liquid savings at all, then um, you may um, consider temporarily either reducing your 401k contributions or stopping them entirely and redirecting the money until you have built up a sufficient emergency reserve. Um, now that said, saving for retirement is still critically important, but it's really important to, again, make sure you have an emergency fund as that's really your first line of defense if something were to happen. Um, 
just don't let this become the new long-term plan. If you do do this, set some sort of calendar reminder either on your on your calendar or on your phone to resume those contributions once you have an adequate reserve in place. Second, um, I think because of the financial and economic uncertainty, a lot of folks are revisiting and paying a much closer attention to, to their budgets. Um, a lot, you know, during these times, many are finding that their incomes are greatly impacted by the current economic crisis and the market pullback. And, and if you find yourself in this situation, now is a good time to review monthly and annual spending and look for ways to cut back on non-essential spending. Now, granted, a lot of that cutting back has happened is happening naturally because we just don't have a choice. Uh, we may not be incurring the same amount of community, commuting expenses because a lot of us are working from home. Restaurant spending, you know, obviously we're not going to restaurants and spending a lot on entertainment. So a lot of that is happening naturally, but to, I think what this is forcing folks to do and something that I've even done for myself is looking at, wow, I was spending um, money on certain things that I, I really found out I could live without that I don't necessarily need. And so there's ways to make good habits, good long-term habits out of, out of um, the recent, uh, recent pullback that we've seen. And now, if you find your budget is tight and you have an emergency reserve, consider using that emergency reserve. Um, don't feel guilty. Remember, that is what that this is what that money is there for. Um, you know. Also, if you expect a tax refund, be sure to file your taxes as soon as possible to get the cash sooner. That'll help provide some extra padding for your budget and emergency reserve as well. Now, as people are reviewing budgets, they're going to find a lot of bills, and there are certain bills that there's just no way to get around. Um, they're still going to come due every month, and a lot of folks are really having um, difficulty in figuring out how are how are you going to pay these core expenses. And but there are relief options, and so there are relief options for things like student loan payments, mortgage rent, and even credit cards. Um, there's various different provisions and and laws that have been enacted to provide a little bit of relief to folks, um, acknowledging that many folks have been impacted and lost wages or have reduced wages due to the coronavirus. Um, specifically related to student loans, the federal government is offering options for borrowers who need help with those student loans if you have a federal student loan. Um, and if you have a federal student loan, you will automatically qualify for some of this relief. Um, and this was part of a, a law that was passed called the CARES Act, where borrowers of federal loans will be placed in what's called administrative forbearance. And this basically allows borrowers to temporarily defer making payments until September 30th. And during this time, no interest will actually accrue um, during that time period. And this would apply, again, to federal student loans, so a Stafford loan, a Grad Plus loan, and, uh, or a Parent Plus loan. It also um, would apply to borrowers if, you're, borrowers if you're using an income-driven repayment plan or in a loan forgiveness plan with the federal government. Now, by default, you shouldn't have to do anything because your loan servicer is required to automatically suspend payments uh, between March 13th and September 30th and change the interest rate on your account to zero. But it's always, again, good practice just to double check and, you know, make sure that if you've got some auto pay feature enabled on your bank account or you're automatically sending a check, you may need to cancel that if it's not an auto draft. So just be sure you're, you're, giving that um, a, a second look just to make sure. Now, as I've mentioned before, that this relief only applies to federal student loans. Um, obviously, there's other private lenders that aren't necessarily covered under this um, loan relief option. However, there are many private lenders and servicers that are offering some flexibility to borrowers who ask for asked to suspend their payments because of impact of COVID-19. However, unlike the federal loans, though, your interest is likely going to continue to accrue, but it's still worthwhile. Contact your lender, explain your situation, and determine what sort of 
forgiveness or flexibility do they have on payments? Is there any payment plans that you can enact? There's certainly um, flexibility and, and lenders have indicated a willingness to, wor to work with borrowers, which is great news because many people have trouble uh, keeping up with student loan payments under normal circumstances. And so obviously much harder um, in this kind of, in this environment than we're in now. Certainly, um, in addition to student loans, many people are looking for ways um, or that are in need of either mortgage or rent relief. You know, May 1st has come and gone and, and many people are scrambling trying to figure out how they're going to make their second round of mortgage or rent payments since this breakout of the coronavirus in kind of mid-March. So if you're financially struggling because of layoffs or reduced pay, you do have some options. Uh, first, um, I will say that if you can make your mortgage or rent payment, then definitely make your payment because there, there are ripple effects. But if you have been financially impacted and are seriously worried about how you're going to make mortgage or rent payments, then I would suggest that you contact your lender or landlord immediately. The most important action you can take is to be proactive in reaching out to lenders and landlords and working out some sort of payment plan together and show that you're, you're being proactive with the situation. So that's the first step. The second step is also just being aware of any federal or state laws that have been acted that you may be able to take advantage of. So specifically through the CARES Act, what you can do is you may be able to apply for forbearance or basically pausing your payments if you have a federal mortgage loan. So this means that you can potentially suspend your monthly payments um, and request forbearance from, from six months up to 12 months. Now that's just a pause, so you're not, you know, your payments aren't going to be forgiven. You still have to make them up, but again, it'll give you some extra time. Um, now this is for federal loans, so that includes borrowers of Fannie or Freddie mortgages or borrowers whose loans are backed by the Federal Housing Administration. So unfortunately, this relief doesn't apply to other kinds of mortgages, um, though I will say there is a there's a coalition of mortgage industry groups have indicated that they do plan to provide some flexibility and uh, plan to grant some payment suspension for a period of time. So again, the key is you have to contact your, your lender to figure out what sort of plan or what sort of agreement can you work out with them. And again, for renters, it's I recommend calling, you know, contacting your land landlord to work out a payment plan if you can't, you know, if you cannot find pay, if you cannot pay. Um, and also just being aware that, you know, for most local governments and a lot of state governments have instituted um, and implemented grace period on evictions. So, for instance, in Austin, there is a 60-day grace period on evictions that has been enacted. In addition to mortgage and rent and, and student loans, we've even actually seen credit card um, providers have indicated a willingness to work with customers who are struggling to pay their bills. So again, if this is you, the first step you want to take is just be proactive. Contact your credit card provider and see if there's any sort of flexibility to skip or defer payments um, during, um, during this time of result of, of So I've alluded this to a couple of times already, but there was a major um, landmark piece of legislation that was passed back in March 27th, um, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act, um, was a major piece of legislation passed by Congress really to provide liquidity to the U.S. economy due to the effects of COVID-19. So you may have heard it referred to as a stimulus bill in the news or the media, but in reality, it's, it's less stimulus and more of a liquidity package. When you think about stimulus, stimulus is traditionally designed to stimulate the economy. But we are obviously in a very different predicament now because we've actually been told to stay home. We don't have many places to spend our money or to stimulate the economy. Um, there's limited actions that we can actually do. But again, it is designed and aimed to inject liquidity and help 
folks with things like rent and bills that are coming due every month. And this major piece of legislation, it's really been astronomical. This is the largest stimulus or, or aid package in modern history, totaling in $2 trillion in funds for individuals and businesses. And really, when you couple it with the additional loan guarantees that are associated and a part of this CARES Act, it really brings the total up to $6 trillion. So again, huge. Um, for reference, $2 trillion is 10% of GDP during a normal year. But again, I think Congress and the Fed realized that they needed to move quickly and significantly. Um, there were lessons learned from the past, whereas in 2008 and 2009, during that crisis, there was a lot of um, thought that there was various different stimulus measures, but many of it, much of it was too little too late. So again, Congress and the Fed really determined that they needed to move quickly and fast because this was a, a, a really dire situation um, moving at a very fast pace. Now, one of the biggest headlines stemming from the CARES Act is the $290 billion of direct payments that are being directly routed to individuals and families uh, you may have heard them referred to as stimulus checks or these one-time payments from the U.S. government. So basically, all U.S. residents, including those with no income, will qualify for this one-time cash payment of $1,200 for each adult and $500 for each child under 17. That's it. That's the requirement to get these payments, though they do start to phase out for certain individuals making above $75,000 a year or couples making more than $150,000 a year. But other than that, there's not a lot of other stipulations gone beyond, you know, you have to have a social security number to get a payment and, you know, you can't be dependent on someone else's tax return if you aren't a child then you don't get a payment. But basically beyond that, you, you get this payment, it doesn't have to be repaid, and it, it's not gonna be taxed to you. Um, now, I have been getting some questions from folks is, well, what should I do with my stimulus check? How should I consider spending it? And I think it really comes down to your individual situation. So while the payment may not make up for a lost paycheck, I think those that who face economic uncertainty and certainly put the money towards expenses of their daily lives. So using it for rent, uh, mortgage payments, uh, bills coming due, groceries, things like that to, to kind of offset their daily expenses. And saving some of that payment might make individual sense too, especially if you're one of those folks that doesn't have that emergency cash reserve to the level you quite need it to be at. You know, this is a kind of a lump sum payment again that I alluded to earlier that you can really take advantage of to help beef up that emergency reserve. Now, if you are a lucky individual um, who doesn't necessarily need the money, you haven't seen a much reduced pay you're not struggling to pay your bills, and you already have uh, uh, an adequate emergency reserve, then you know you can you can look at other things that you might want to spend this money on. Um, what I've heard some a lot of folks doing is donating it to charities or food banks or um, organizations that are in dire need um, during this global health pandemic. So that may be something to consider too, and and using this money for good. Another major aspect of the CARES Act has to do with unemployment benefits and expanded unemployment benefits. You know, almost immediately it was clear that through the social distancing policies, um, government ordered lockdowns, all this would have a really dramatic impact on businesses and their ability to retain workers. That expectation has proved to be a reality because we're seeing individuals applying for unemployment has surpassed 30 million, the highest ever. So in response, the CARES Act came out to significantly expand these unemployment benefits. So who is eligible for unemployment benefits or insurance? Basically, you're eligible if you've been laid off um, or furloughed from your job. But what the CARES Act did is it expanded 
um, this to workers who are typically not eligible to receive benefits um, from unemployment, such as self-employed individuals and independent contractors. And so this was huge because those were folks that were severely impacted as well uh, by, coronavi by the uh, coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, and what, as I mentioned, the CARES Act greatly expanded the amount of benefits available. So basically the, the plan provides a 13 week extension of unemployment insurance that's typically provided by the states while also providing an additional benefit of $600 per week for up to four months. So just as an example, here in Texas, you can get up to 26 weeks of benefits. What the CARES Act does is it extends that by 13 weeks, so you're now eligible for a total of 39 weeks of benefits. And um, in Texas, the maximum benefit you can get through unemployment is $500 per week, and it's based on your wages um, that you received prior to getting uh, laid off or furloughed. What the CARES Act does is it adds another $600 on top of that. So you could potentially get a total of $1,100 per week, which more than doubles that benefit. So definitely not insignificant. Um, and to imply, typically it's administered on, at the state level. So you have to apply through your state's um, website or over the phone. And not surprisingly, I mean, this is the biggest headline is states have been incredibly overwhelmed by the demand and the applications for benefits. So most folks are having um, better luck by applying online just because it's much harder to get um, through to anyone on the phones because of the high level of calls. The CARES Act also wanted to enact some different provisions related to retirement accounts and retirement plans just to make it a little bit easier for folks to access some funds that they may have set aside in, um, in, re in retirement accounts. Um, so they provided what is called a coronavirus related distribution and some rules around this distribution. And basically, if you have been impacted by the coronavirus, you can take a distribution of up to $100,000 from an IRA uh, or an employer-sponsored retirement plan like a 401k or a combination of both as long as it's made in 2020 and that you're an individual who's been impacted by the coronavirus. Uh, and, and in general, you know, they made the this very broadly available. It's not really hard to qualify. You could be diagnosed with COVID-19 or have a spouse or dependent that was diagnosed. You could, you know, have maybe experienced adverse financial consequences as a result of being quarantined, furloughed, or laid off, or reduced hours, or perhaps you're unable to work because you lack childcare. Anyways, they, they intentionally made this very broad. Um, so that you, you know, for folks who really need to access funds that they may have set aside in retirement plans that they can. And in general, they also added on some t potential tax benefits as well. So first off is they, um, they made these distributions exempt from the 10% penalty. So generally, individuals who are under age 59 and a half access um, retirement funds, but you're, you're generally subject to a 10% penalty taxes are owed. Now, um, if it's a coronavirus-related distribution, you can take a distribution that's still a taxable distribution, so it's still taxable income. You're just not going to be subject to that additional 10% penalty on top. Two is they waive the mandatory withholding requirements. Typically, if you take a distribution from a retirement plan, there's 20% mandatory withholding. They just waive that. And then three, um, they've made these distributions eligible to be repaid over a three-year period. So, you know, say you take a distribution, you could pay it back in one single rollover or in multiple different rollovers as long as it's made during a three-year window from the date that you um, took that distribution. Um, if you do pay it back, then, you know, you may be able to uh, claim a refund on any taxes that would have been attributed to that rollover amount. So you may, um, if you find yourself in that situation, you may, you may want to file an amended return. So again, you can recoup some of those taxes paid. Um, the other thing to be aware of is when you take a distribution, as I mentioned, it's taxable income. 
And by default, what they're doing is they're going to spread that income over three years. So over 2020, 2021, and 2022. That's the default. But, you know, as a taxpayer, however, you can elect to have all of that income from a coronavirus related distribution in your 2020 income. And that may be particularly advantageous if you're one of these folks who unfortunately you, you anticipate your income to be much lower this year. Um, so if you're in a lower tax bracket, you may want to go ahead and realize that income this year rather than in future years. The CARES Act also addressed and provided some additional flexibility around loans. So obviously we just talked about distributions from from retirement plans, but there's some loan features that are available from employer-sponsored plans. So if you are a participant in a retirement plan like a 401k that allows loans, there's some additional flexibility. One is the CARES Act. It increased the maximum loan amount to $100,000, where it used to be the max um, you could ever take out was $50,000. So it, it, in effect, doubled the amount um, that you could potentially take out on loan. Two is that you can now, um, you know, an individual, if you're eligible to take, to take out a loan, um, you could take a loan of 100% of your vested account balance, whereas it used to be um, you could only take a loan up to 50% of your vested account balance. Again, the CARES Act amends this rule, allowing you to take a loan equal to um, your vested account balance, dollar for dollar, up to that $100,000 maximum. And um, there's in a delay of payment. So you can actually delay any payments on the loan for up to a year. So again, much more flexibility here. If you really find yourself in a dire situation, you're strapped for cash and need cash um, to pay for expenses. There, of course, is also some tax-related, um, specific tax-related uh, relief um, that has been passed. And many of you are probably aware that the IRS has extended the April 15th tax filing and payment deadline to July 15th. So obviously some extra time there. Um, I will caution that if you're one of those folks that expect a refund, I don't recommend waiting. Then, you know, if you're, if you're expecting a refund, then go ahead and file as quickly as possible just so you can get your cash refund sooner. And then just another note, if you are one of those folks who pays in quarterly estimated tax payments, um, Q1 and Q2 payments have also been extended um, to July 15th. CARES Act also provided um, some additional benefits. Um, one is this new, uh, what I'll call an above the line charitable deduction. So it's fairly small. It's not gonna have some dramatic impact on your overall overall tax situation. It's limited to $300, but it is a new above the line charitable deduction that many folks will be able to take advantage of. A couple of stipulations that it, it's gotta be a cash donation and it's gotta be made to a charity this year. So it can't be made to a donor advised fund or you know maybe a certain uh, an organization that supports charities. Um, it's gotta be a cash donation directly to a charity, like if you do it to a food bank or Feeding America or uh, you know whatever um, other organization you might have contributed to. And um, it only applies if you do not itemize on Schedule A. So it's kind of reversed. So typically, if you're a, someone who makes a charitable donation to a qualified um, charity, you typically only get any tax benefit if you're able to itemize your deductions. You take that charitable deduction on your, on your itemized deduction on Schedule A. This is to help address uh, that, that need for folks who don't itemize and who just take the standard deduction. So if you're one of those folks who takes a standard deduction, then you can qualify for this new $300 above the line charitable deduction. Let me skip back here. Um, the other thing, um, tax rate, tax related relief that came out through the CARES Act was um, this deferral of required minimum distributions for the calendar year 2020. So under current law, holders of 401k accounts or traditional retirement accounts like IRAs, they're required to withdraw a percentage of their account balance each year once you reach age 72. It used to be age 70 and a half, now it's age 72. 
So this requirement assures that the money in these tax favored savings accounts, retirement accounts are, are used to provide income during retirement rather than letting folks just accumulate wealth in these accounts, in these tax deferred accounts to then pass on to the heirs. So typically the, this required distribution, it's calculated to be spread over the life expectancy of the account owner's life. But what it does is it allows folks to skip this distribution, this taxable distribution in 2020. So it may be really advantageous for folks who don't necessarily need the funds to live off of. Um, they can skip the taxable distribution that they have to typically make, and they can continue to allow their funds to continue to grow on a tax deferred basis. So uh, maybe a good planning tool here for folks that don't necessarily need the money um, that these required minimum distributions We've dissected a lot of the relief available through the CARES Act. That's been a lot of uh, questions I've been fielding from clients and colleagues and um, just folks I've come into contact to. I would say the second kind of area where I've been getting a lot of questions is just what should, you know, what should folks continue to do in terms of investing and, and saving for retirement, um, whether it's a 401k or other retirement accounts. Um, you know, people are wondering, should you keep contributing? Should I wait until this whole COVID-19 episode is behind us? You know, what should we do? What should I do? That's, that's the question I often hear. And here is what, ultimately, I think this is a, actually a great time to ramp up long-term savings. Um, because of a couple of things. Is one, we know that markets have rewarded long-term diversified investors. A long-term diversified investor has never experienced a permanent loss in the market unless they panicked and sold. Um, two is assuming you should you have built up a sufficient emergency reserve fund, then you should certainly continue contributing, um, especially true if your employers off if your employer offers a match of any kind, again, this is free money that you don't want to leave on the table. And you also don't want to derail your long-term retirement savings plan. And then the last piece I think is really important is when you're making recurring contributions into your 401k plan, whether it's bi-weekly or once a month, you can take advantage of what's called dollar cost averaging. So the, this is where you're you know, periodically buying into the market at various different prices. And you can actually take advantage of time periods when the market is volatile. So when markets are low and it have come down significantly as they have in recent months, then your dollars go farther in terms of number of shares that you can afford. So now is a really good time where you can actually acquire a larger number of shares at fire sale prices. So once you've made the decision, if you're going to con continue to keep contributing to your 401k, you know, the second round of questions you may have is, well, what should I be doing with this money that I'm investing? What, you know, what should I be doing with my current allocation? Is now a good time to continue to buy stocks? Or should I, you know, keep this money safeguarded in something like, you know, like a money market or a bond fund? And, or how long is this going to last? Um, these are all questions that, uh, I'm sure many of you have um, replayed in your mind or are wondering on, on your end. I think the first piece, um, just to help us frame this, you know, how to think about investing during a market environment like we're in now, is one just acknowledging that we as humans, we're not hardwired to be good investors because we're emotional beings. We let fear and greed often drive our investment decisions, which actually often leads to really poor investment um, outcomes. The first step is just to realize that when it comes to investing, you almost have to be very clinical and matter of fact about it and be very disciplined. Um, and obviously staying disciplined through rising and falling markets can really pose a challenge, but it really is um, critical and crucial for long-term success. I think it's also important to acknowledge that market downturns are actually a normal part of investing. So 
every market downturn is going to be different than the last, and we certainly don't know the cause or the circumstances around each downturn ahead of time. Uh, we typically don't know the, you know, the severity or duration ahead of time, but we should know to expect them. Because on average, there's a downturn um, of 20% or more about once every decade, about once every 10 years, once every decade or so. What this chart does is it illustrates the historical performance of the S&P 500 index, and it highlights the periods when the market was rising and falling. So the bear markets are these areas in red that are defined as downturns of 20% or greater while these bull markets in blue are rises from those trough of those downturns to the next high. And in general, we can see that the good times for the market have been much longer and greater in magnitude than the bad times. So we should expect positive returns every day in the market. You know, and knowing that there's no consistent way to predict when the realized performance will be positive or negative. But investors staying the course have been rewarded over the long term. So even with these downturns, we know that the average, you know, the, the average annualized rate of return for the S&P 500 historically has been about 10%. So in order to receive a 10% annualized rate of return, what you have to do is stay disciplined and stay invested in both these good and bad times in both bear and bull markets. And of course, one of the key antidotes to help weather these, these bear markets and to weather the, those storms and these crises that we're going to face is to maintain a diversified and long-term perspective. Um, and so we can look at a number of different crises, all very different from each other. Um, just like the crisis that we're in now, this global pandemic, is very different from the last financial crisis that we went through in 2008, 2009. And that crisis was very different from the dot-com crash, which was very different from the stock market crash of 1987. They're all very different, but we can still draw lessons from the past to help us inform our plans going forward. So what this chart does is looks at and examines how a balanced portfolio, uh, a globally diversified portfolio that had 60% allocated to, to stocks, 40% allocated to bonds, how did that balanced portfolio perform either a year after this market crisis, three years after the market crisis, or five years after the market crisis? Um, signaled by these bar charts in uh, one year is blue, three years is yellow, and five years is green. You can see that in almost every situation, a balanced 60 portfolio experienced a positive return in the following 12 months. And then in every instance, in, after every crisis, a globally diversified 60-40 portfolio experienced a positive return in the following three-year period and the following five-year period. So as you increase your investment time horizon and outlook, you increase the likelihood of a positive return. So again, you want to have a portfolio that you can withstand to help you see across the valley to the next peak, so to speak. Still though, you may be wondering, is now a good time to invest? Should I wait until this all blows over or until we really hit market bottom? And what we know is that is, is it's extremely difficult to accurately time the market on a consistent basis. Investors are much better served in sticking with their, their agreed upon plan. So, and you know, there's usually no good signal. So even if you look at investing at when markets are at all time highs or when markets are at all time lows, you know, the average subsequent returns are still positive regardless if you're investing it after an all time high or an all time low. So that's why you should always expect a positive premium whenever you're investing in the market. And two, you know, related to that, I'll mention that there's usually no indication to signal to us that we've clearly reached a market bottom and that the worst is behind us. Oftentimes, you know, the stock market moves much more quickly than the overall economy. So for example, 
if you look at the last 80 years, the market has bottomed out on average 107 days before the end of a recession. So if you wait until the end of a recession to begin investing, you've likely already missed much of the stock market rebound. And that's um, exactly what we saw after 2008, 2009, when we hit the bottom of March of 09. It wasn't very clear at that time that that was the bottom, but there was a huge run up in the stock market that happened after that, um, well before the end of the recession was announced. But while you're revisiting your investment portfolio, you know, now it is a great time to re-examine your overall risk allocation and assure, ensure it's appropriate based on your goals and your risk tolerance. So, you know, consider and ask yourself, have you actually lost sleep over the past couple of months thinking about your investment portfolio? And if so, that may be an indication that perhaps you're much more risk averse than you initially thought. So the goal is that you find an overall risk allocation that you're going to be able to sleep at night, that you're going to be comfortable with in both good and bad times, and that can be a delicate balance. Um, there are some general rules of thumb, though. Obviously, you know, risk allocations and risk tolerances are going to look, are likely going to look very different from someone who is 20 to 30 years away from retirement versus someone who's actually in retirement. Um, as you approach a retirement, and once you get to that point, I generally advise that you have at least five to 10 years worth of the retirement withdrawal needs in short-term high-quality fixed income. Short-term high-quality fixed income is generally going to be the portion of your portfolio that's going to hold up well during significant market downturns in the stock market like we've seen recently. So, for instance, Say you're in retirement and you need about $20,000 a year from your retirement portfolio on an annual basis to supplement your Social Security to, to cover your living needs in retirement. So if you need $20,000 a year and if you want to target between 5 and 10 years worth, then you, then you likely need somewhere between $100,000 to $200,000 of your portfolio allocated to short-term high-quality fixed income, and then the remaining portion can be in a diversified basket of equities or stock funds. This should, in theory, give you enough, let's say, runway or time to weather any storm in the stock market and let markets recover, because you know at least where your distributions are coming from in, for the next five to ten years, and you know that portion of your portfolio is not going to uh, dramatically change in value it's gonna hold up its value relatively well. And then the equity portion, um, you know, you've got enough runway to let that recover. You're not dipping into a declining asset to supplement your living needs. The second thing you should determine and, and look at and examine is if you need to rebalance your portfolio. Um, so what is rebalancing? And in essence, rebalancing is, it's a disciplined and systematic way to ensure that you are consistently selling high and buying low and maintaining your long-term asset allocation. That's the essence of a successful investment experience. So over time, the value of individual mutual funds in a diversified portfolio, they're going to move up and down, drifting away from target weights that help achieve proper diversification. And since the stock market decline over the past few months, the stock portion of your portfolio has likely gone down relative to the bond portion. And although this may seem counterintuitive, you may actually want to rebalance your portfolio to move some of your bonds back into stocks to maintain that proper balance between stocks and bonds. So this ensures that you maintain your long-term asset allocation and that you're actually buying back into equities at these lower fire sale prices, and that you'll be there to capture the rebound in equities when they do occur. 
Now, a lot of uh, retirement accounts, like 401k accounts, they may have a feature where it automatically rebalances either on a preset schedule or when your tolerance, when your weights get out of tolerance, out of certain threshold or bands. Um, so that may be something you want to revisit to look at when, what, how is your portfolio rebalanced? Um, and if it's not automatic, then you may need to go and manually do that yourself. Now, in terms of kind of the market environment, I've also been um, fielding a lot of questions about refinancing mortgages. Obviously, interest rates have fallen to record lows, and um, as a result, mortgage rates have fallen to record lows as well. Uh, now, refinancing can certainly be a good way. Um, you know, can be a good option depending on what your goals are. So if you're looking to reduce your monthly payments or perhaps to shorten your loan term, maybe, you know, reducing from a 30-year to a 15-year to pay off your mortgage faster, this may be a good time. Um, that said, you, you really need to consider the full package and, and consider the closing costs to refinance as well. Um, and also look at, you know, how long do you plan to be in your home? You want to make sure that you plan to be in your home long enough to make refinancing and the closing costs worth it. Um, also, just be aware that because of the increase in demand, lenders, I mean, they're being overwhelmed by, by these refinance applications. So just be prepared and expect the process of shopping and closing to take longer than normal. They're just getting um, inundated with these applications and requests. Now is also a good time to re-examine traditional versus Roth options. So um, unfortunately for many folks, incomes are projected to be lower in 2020. And more people may find that they're eligible to make contributions to Roth IRAs in 2020, which are typically subject to income limitations. Um, so uh, just as a general background, Roth IRAs are generally are completely phased out for individuals making more than $139,000 or for couples, uh, married filing joint couples making over $206,000 a year. Um, that only applies to Roth IRAs. There's no income limitations if your 401k allows for Roth deferrals. So just something to be aware of there. But if you find you're expecting lower income this year and you aren't in need of that you aren't in need of that immediate tax deduction provided by a traditional IRA contribution or a traditional 401k deferral, you may consider switching to Roth deferrals for the year. Also, um, in light of the uh, recent market pullback, um, Roth conversions may be a particularly appealing tactic for 2020. So this is the process where you actually take, if you have um, a traditional IRA, you can take part of that and convert it to a Roth where you pay taxes on, on that conversion amount this year. And then the amount that's converted to the Roth, you've already paid taxes and that can continue to go continue to grow tax deferred or tax exempt and you don't have to pay taxes ever again once after after you do the conversion. Ultimately though, before you do that, you still need to look at this from a tax perspective. Um, it's still a tax question. Must consider still whether you would rather pay tax on the conversion amount of your at your income tax rate today or at your expected income tax rate in the future. Um, but if you find, if you expect to be paying taxes at a higher rate in the future, if you find yourself in a much lower tax bracket today, and perhaps a lot of people are because of the financial impact of COVID-19, then the timing of a Roth conversion could really have a really big impact this year, especially while account values are lower. So it's definitely something to consider, bring up and ask your CPA or your CFP or your advisor if you're working with someone. And of course, I'll always put in a plug, it's always a good time to review your estate plan um, and ensure you have all the proper documents and they're up to date, whether it's your um, wills, your healthcare proxies, HIPAA release, advanced medical directives. These are key estate planning documents that most individuals should have. Um, and typically a must have if you're married and especially if you have young children um, or dependent children. Um, these are documents that where you can actually put your wishes in place um, of what happens to your assets after you pass. And it also helps you name folks that you want to have access to your healthcare information or to make healthcare related 
decisions if you can't do so on your own. Um, you get to name someone who can help make medical decisions on your behalf. So I think just in light of what's going on, it's more important than ever to make sure you have proper documents in place and that they're up to date uh, so that you have everything planned out as you would wish. Uh, I know we've covered a lot today. Um, as I mentioned, we have a more detailed uh, blog post highlighting some of these financial planning tips under the Insights section at our website at mlrwm.com. Um, while we're there, you can check out, we have a variety of other different financial planning related articles and videos um, that you can peruse. And if you want to stay in touch with our content, you can also subscribe to our newsletter in the know. Um, so you're, it's available to subscribe on our website. Site. And then, of course, um, you can find us on social media, too. We're all often posting um, our articles and, and content there. Um, you can find us on Facebook, um, LinkedIn, or Twitter, and, and follow us there. Of course, if, if you do have questions, feel free to reach out and contact us, again, at our website. We'd be happy to answer questions or continue the conversation. Uh, otherwise, I hope you all are staying healthy and safe, and just remember that um, this too shall pass. Thank you.